I'm Susan Euler. Everybody's familiar with Gothic cathedrals, but may know very little about them. In this program, we're going to trace the development of the Gothic style and see the impact it made on Western civilization, not just in the Middle Ages, but up until the present day. <laughs> The Gothic style began around the year 1140 when Abbot Suje, who was an architect as well as a cleric, decided to rebuild the Royal Abbey Church of Saint Denis in a new and daring style of his own creation. Saint Denis, or Saint Denis, is the patron saint of France. He was beheaded in 250 AD on orders of the Roman government for preaching Christianity. According to the legend, after his beheading, he calmly picked up his head and walked with it for about six miles down the northern slope of what was then called the Hill of Mars. He finally collapsed and died in what is now the Paris suburb of Saint-Denis. The church of Saint-Denis was built on the site of his death. The Hill of Mars was renamed during the Middle Ages as Montmartre, the Hill of the Martyrs, after Saint-Denis. Today the church of Saint-Denis looks quite different from what it did during the 12th century. For one thing, the North Bell Tower was dismantled in 1844 after it was hit by lightning and deemed unsafe. This gives the whole facade a kind of stubby appearance that was not part of the original design. However, the eastern end still looks much as it did in Abbot Suje's time, with soaring stone vaults and large stained glass windows, both hallmarks of the Gothic style. Although pointed arches had been used before, Suje took advantage of their inherent strength to create a strongly vertical design, giving the church's interior the appearance of literally reaching into heaven. The vaulted stone ceiling created by the joining of pointed arches, called groin vaulting, reinforces the sense of height and grandeur. Finally, the huge stained glass windows fill the space with light. This was a completely new concept. Suje wrote that these windows created a crown of light, leading the worshipers to a greater understanding of the light of God. Well, as soon as Suje's church was open for public view, every bishop, archbishop, abbot, and parish priest wanted one just like it. Therefore, during the 12th and 13th centuries, there was a frenzy of church building activity going on across Europe. As communities competed with one another to build the fanciest and most elaborate church in what they called the French style, vaults were pushed higher and higher. This led to the invention of the flying buttress, another hallmark of the Gothic style. Flying buttresses literally push against the walls, exerting enough pressure to offset the lateral thrust that causes the high stone vaults to bow outward and collapse. But stone is only so strong. Finally, in 1284, the nave of Beauvais Cathedral, the tallest Gothic church ever built, collapsed. It was never rebuilt, leaving only the apse of Beauvais to serve as the cathedral, which is impressive enough in and of itself. After the collapse of Beauvais, architects quit pushing for higher vaults, turning their attention instead to more decoration, and later Gothic churches, done in what is called the flamboyant style, are covered with lacy decoration. This was too much for the Italians, who in the 15th century were in the midst of the Italian Renaissance, and their focus was on a return to the clean classical lines of Greece and Rome. So they regarded all the lacy frou-frou from France as barbaric, akin to the sacking of Rome a thousand years earlier by the northern Gothic tribes. And this so-called French style? Well, it was the style of the barbaric Goths. It was Gothic. That's where the name comes from, and although a criticism, it's been used ever since. Now let's move closer to our own time and look at a style known as Gothic Revival.
Although Renaissance Italians pronounced the Gothic style barbaric, it remained vital all during the 15th and 16th centuries. The international Gothic illuminated prayer books and Bibles were especially popular with the rich. These lavishly illustrated books, depicting court life, have forever colored our perception of what life was like in the Middle Ages. Painted in jewel-like colors, they show beautiful people in elegant clothes, set against a background of fairy tale castles, which have provided inspiration for generations of writers, artists, and animators. The same is true of the tapestry, which also depict a magical fairy tale world of chivalry that never really existed. In the unicorn tapestries, the figures are set against a lush background of trees and flowering shrubs, while a natural carpet of flowers is beneath their feet. Called a mille fleurs pattern, literally thousand flowers, it is also seen in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Annunciation. Each flower is symbolic and has both secular and religious significance. Dandelions refer to the passion of Christ, orchids to fertility and marriage, and so on. It's complicated and not really fully understood by modern people. In 1749, English art historian, writer, and politician Horace Walpole built Strawberry Hill, a fantasy castle right out of the international Gothic book illustrations. Featuring round towers, crenellated battlements, and lots and lots of Gothic embellishments inside and out, Strawberry Hill incorporates elements from both church and secular architecture. One outstanding feature is the fan vaulted ceiling, which Walpole copied from the Lady Chapel of Henry VII but without King Henry's restrained sense of good taste. In any event, Strawberry Hill was a big hit, the earliest example of the Gothic Revival style. Before long, Gothic Revival houses sprung up everywhere, large palatial mansions to small cottages. Grant Wood's famous painting, American Gothic, is a comment on this style. Gothic Revival was partly a reaction against neoclassicism, which had largely dominated art and architecture since the Renaissance. But it goes beyond that. In the early years of the 19th century, when Gothic Revival became extremely popular, people were just beginning to feel the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution, with its air pollution, noise, and increased human misery. They wanted to escape, and what better place to go for refuge than the Middle Ages? Knights in shining armor, stained glass windows everywhere, strong religious values, the Middle Ages were remembered as a fine time to be alive. One group of artists and writers who called themselves the Pre-Raphaelites set out to reform art by going back to the more lush and detailed style of the early 15th century before artists such as Raphael ruined it with classical poses and contrived compositions. Much of their work draws heavily on medieval flower symbolism and international Gothic mille fleur design. William Morris, a leading member of the Pre-Raphaelites, was especially concerned about how mechanized production destroyed craftsmanship and led to the loss of traditional artistic skills. In 1861, he founded a company that designed and produced decorative objects such as wallpaper and tapestries, stained glass windows, and furniture, all by hand, using traditional methods. His handcrafted products were seen as a more authentic alternative to the mass-produced furniture and decorative objects that dominated the 19th century market and still do today. Like all the Pre-Raphaelites, Morris was strongly influenced by medieval design. His work was so successful that it inspired the slightly later arts and crafts movement. William Morris's wallpaper and furniture can still be purchased today. No discussion of 19th century Gothic revival can be complete without looking at the Palace of Westminster, better known as the Houses of Parliament. Despite what most people think, the Houses of Parliament do not date from the Middle Ages. Rather, they are Gothic revival, designed by Sir Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin in 1836. The Gothic revival style was chosen because the Middle Ages were seen as a time when Great Britain flourished. In addition, the style was understood to represent spiritual goodness, truth, and a proper reverence for God. And it was also the ultimate expression of Christianity, which was, and is, an important concern of the British monarchy, who are heads of the church as well as heads of state. Incidentally, Charles Barry also designed Highclere Castle, 
the home of Lord Carnarvon. It was Lord Carnarvon who funded the dig that discovered King Tut's tomb. High Clear is perhaps better known today as the setting for the popular television series Downton Abbey. For the 10 Minute Professor, this is Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you watch our next program.